Hello and welcome to Unworthy History. On today's episode, I'm going to bring you some actual history from this book right here, True Stories of the American Indians by Edward Sylvester Ellis. Now the story we're going to read today is about the Jamestown settlement, the first permanent settlement in Virginia, and their interactions with the Powhatan Indians, or the Powhatan Confederacy. This chapter is called The Original Emperors of Virginia, Powhatan and Opencancano. The first permanent settlement made in the original 13 states was at Jamestown, Virginia, by the English in the spring of 1607. The settlers were at once brought in contact with two famous Indians to whom we must now give attention. The London Company, formed for the planting of colonies in the New World, sent three ships across the ocean in the month of December 1606. They carried 105 men but no women and were in charge of Captain Christopher Newport. They sailed up the Chesapeake Bay and were charmed by the soft breezes, the fragrant wildflowers, and the beautiful scenery. They halted at a peninsula, now an island, about 50 miles from the mouth of the James River, so named in honor of their king, and began putting up cabins. Thus Jamestown was founded on the 13th of May, 1607. At that time, the country from the Allegheny to the ocean, and from the southern James to the Patuxent River, was inhabited by three families of Indians, each composed of a number of tribes. With two of them, we have nothing to do in this story. The Powhatans lived in the lowland region, reaching from the Carolinas on the south to the Patuxent on the north, and between the sea to the falls of the rivers. They had more tribes than either of the other families, ten being between the Potomac and the Rappahannock, five between the Rappahannock and the York, eight between the York and the James, and five between the James and the Carolinas. The Powhatan League was one of the most powerful on the continent and occupied what is now Henrico County, Virginia, on the shores of the James River and about two days' journey from Jamestown. You will see that the head of this league or confederacy ruled over thousands of warriors, most of whom he had conquered and compelled to accept him as sovereign, whose will the bravest underchief dared not dispute. In order to give him his proper importance, historians generally refer to him as emperor, a title which it would seem was proper. He is known as Powhatan, which is the same name as his special tribe, or rather as his chief seat or capital. This old town had a dozen houses which stood a short distance below the present city of Richmond on the banks of the river. Fronting it were three islets. At the time of the settlement of Jamestown, Powhatan was about 60 years old. He was gaunt and tall and as vigorous in body and mind as a man of half his years, and the gray hair, which was plentifully sprinkled through the black locks, gave a majesty to his looks. His headdress was made of a mass of feathers, and his robe of state was of raccoon skins. The wooden bench or form upon which he was accustomed to sit might be taken as a throne, and his reign over many tribes, most of whom he had conquered, gave a certain fitness to the name of emperor. It should be noted that never did his son follow him to the throne, but instead his brothers, then his sisters, and then the heirs of the oldest sister all in turn were to inherit power. Powhatan usually kept two score of his bravest warriors as a bodyguard about him, but when he learned of the coming of the Pale Faces to the mouth of the river, he made the number 200. He had favorite places where he passed the different seasons, a fashion that was often followed by the Indian chiefs in New England. The settlement of Jamestown brings forward the name of the most remarkable pioneer connected with our early history, Captain John Smith, the father of Virginia. Could we believe one half that this man told about himself, we should have to admit that he was one of the greatest heroes in history. He was a great boaster and many of the things he told were simple invention. More than one of the most daring exploits that he claimed to have performed in the old world would have been proved impossible. Nonetheless, Captain John Smith was brave, enterprising, unselfish, tactful, industrious, and far-seeing. And but for him, Jamestown would have perished from the earth within a few months after building the first cabins. 
Enough of him is known to prove that he was not only the founder, but the savior of Jamestown. Smith was a native of Lincolnshire, England, and when he reached Virginia, he was not 30 years old. He had a powerful physique and did not hide his disgust with the gentlemen of the colony, who thought themselves too good to work. He gave them the choice of working or starving, and he set the good example of toiling as hard as any of them. The settlers with whom he came did not reach Virginia until the planting season was over, and before long all were suffering for food. The only thing left to do was to get it from the Indians, and Smith set out to do so. But the Indians knew of the needs of the pale faces and despised them therefore. Smith tried to get them to sell, but they refused, or at most would give him but a handful of corn for a gun or a sword. Seeing no other means left, Smith and his men opened fire on the churlish fellows, drove them into the woods, and marching into their village, carried a good supply of corn back to Jamestown. For many years after the discovery of America, it was thought that it was only a narrow strip of land, and that a short journey to the westward would take one to the South Sea on the other side. As late as 1609, when Henry Hudson sailed up the stream named for him, it was in the belief that he had not far to go to reach that vast body of water. Captain Smith was ordered to explore the streams in the neighborhood of Jamestown. In obedience to this command, he set out to learn the sources of the Chickahominy. He went up that stream until the waters became too shallow to allow the barge to go farther. When he stepped with two of his men and two friendly Indians into a canoe and paddled away, he told those left in the boat to stay in the middle of the stream and forbade them to approach either bank until he came back. But he had not been gone long when those that remained became tired of sitting motionless in the barge, knowing that their leader could not join them for many hours and mayhap not for two or three days. Peering into the woods and listening, they saw and heard nothing to cause fear. So after talking for a little time, they paddled to shore and stepped out on land. They had hardly done so when they were attacked by Indians, and one was killed immediately, the others escaping with great difficulty. The news they took back to Jamestown made everyone believe they would never again see Smith or his companions. Meanwhile, the pioneer was pushing his way into the wilderness with no thought of what had befallen the men left behind in the barge. The light canoe was just buoyant enough to float himself and friends, and they paddled up the narrowing stream with all possible care. The day was wearing away, and since they had no food, Smith decided to hunt for wild fowl. Landing, he went forward alone, never dreaming that open Kankano, with a large body of warriors, was tracking him through the woods. This chief came upon the two Englishmen while they were asleep, and killed both. Then they hurried after Smith, who they knew could not be far away. When the pioneer caught sight of the dusky figures flitting among the trees, firing their arrows and pressing towards him, he tried to retreat to his canoe, but soon saw that he would be cut off. He seized one of his Indian companions and swung him around in front as a shield. The pursuers did not wish to harm a member of their own race, and Smith found for a time that the novel armor served him well. As fast as he could load his gun, he fired into the swarm of warriors, who were so close together that he did not miss. He wounded a number and said he killed three, which very well may be true. The doughty pioneer could give no attention to his feet since he dared not take his eyes off his pursuers. He was slowly falling back and hopeful of getting away when he stepped into a marsh into which he immediately sank above his knees. Even when in this plight, the Indians were afraid to lay hands on him. They would steal forward and then scramble in a panic for the shelter of the tree trunks, afraid he was about to fire his terrible gun at them. Smith struggled hard to free himself from the mire, but with every effort he only sank deeper. The weather was cold, and seeing that he must perish if he stayed where he was, he set free his human shield and flung away his weapons. He expected to be killed at once, but the captors drew him out of the mud and led him back to the place where the two Englishmen had been slain, and where a fire was kindled. The warmth of this brought back his vigor and hopefulness, and seeing no disposition to do him immediate harm, he asked for their chief. The famous Opakankano came forward. The captive handed him a small compass. The chief took it in his hand while his warriors gathered around and all studied the odd-looking instrument with deep interest. 
The darting about of the tiny needle filled them with wonder, and for the moment no one thought of doing the white man any harm. Smith says that through the compass he made clear to the Indians the roundness of the globe, the spheres of the sun, moon, and stars, the revolution of the earth on its axis, the immensity of the land and sea, the diversity of the nations, the antipodes, and many other such like matters, so that all stood amazed with admiration. And yet, how are we to believe that, unable as he was to speak the Indian language, Smith explained these strange things to the Indians, or that they could have gained any idea of his meaning? Such a feat was surely beyond his power. The compass, however, was to serve a good purpose, for when the warriors had tied Smith to a tree and were about to fire their arrows at him, Opakankano held up the curious instrument and they stopped. The captive was taken to the home of Powhatan on York River and well treated. Indeed, he was fed so much that he began to suspect that they were fattening him up in order that he might make a fine meal for them. The capture of the leader of the colony sharpened the appetites of the Indians for greater deeds, and they got ready to destroy Jamestown. They tried by every means they could think of to get Smith to help them, promising him much land and the finest of their women as wives. However, nothing could lead Smith to turn against his countrymen, and he tried to show his captors that their plan was hopeless. Smith then did a slight thing of itself, which filled the Indians with wonder. Taking a blank leaf from his pocketbook, he wrote upon it a brief account of the plot, and asked his friends to send him a number of articles which he named, and which he promised the Indians they could get by taking a slip of paper to Jamestown. The messengers made the journey in the face of severe weather, and brought back the things which Smith had promised. How he managed thus to talk with his friends many miles away was a mystery which the native mind could not then grasp. Since the Indians had to give up their plan of capturing Jamestown, they tried to impress him with their greatness. He was taken from place to place among the different tribes, and finally brought back to Opakankano. He was feasted again, the Indians looking upon him as a sort of god. He was next led into the presence of the mighty Powhatan, where, after a time, it was decided to put him to death. This brings us to the incident which is the most famous in the history of Captain John Smith. He says his head was laid upon two large stones, and the warriors were about to beat out his brains, when Pocahontas, the favorite daughter of Powhatan, and not more than ten or twelve years old, threw her arms around the prisoner's neck and prayed her father to spare him. He could not refuse the pleadings of his loved child. Whether such an incident ever took place will never be known. While it is not impossible, many doubt its truth. It seems to have been an afterthought of the grim boaster, for years passed without anyone hearing a reference of it, and it was not until the death of Pocahontas that Captain Smith told how he had passed through such a strange experience. So we're going to stop there for this episode. Again, this is from this uh, new book, the first time I've been reading from it, True Stories of the American Indians. So here we learned about uh, the actual history behind uh, Jamestown and John Smith's interactions with the Powhatan Indians. Of course, this history has been subject to an interpretation by Disney uh, and others, but this is an account from a book over 100 years old. So if you want to hear more episodes like this, then be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.